are live. Oh, guys, thank you for joining us on the social work race. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> it's, been, it's been an interesting week. It's Monday. <laughs> it's Monday. Uh, this is... Monday is sometimes equivalent to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. But I want to thank you all for joining us on the Social Work Race podcast. It's going to be a video cast as well now. Um, today we're talking about a couple of very interesting topics. And I have someone here that I've met a few times before in, in my work, or we've met each other. Um, Elizabeth, I want to thank you for joining us. Guys, as you're listening, please share, please subscribe and share and subscribe again um, because this platform is about people learning how to social work effectively. And again, I'm going to do a podcast on, on why I set this up. It's actually quite, um, it's a lot deeper than just entertainment. It's a little bit more than education. But I, I really want you all to just find this a place where you as frontline workers, social workers, everybody out there who's interested in the social care field can come and feel like they can learn something. And at the end of every session, the aim is that we can hear this, Elizabeth, because it's on you now. I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> at, the, at the end of every session, um, I want you to be able to walk away with be more enabled in what you do that's the pressure that's on you um but i want to thank you elizabeth we met at you were in fact you know i'll let you introduce yourself and i'll tell you where we met after that actually elizabeth please introduce yourself okay uh, yeah i'm elizabeth i am a social worker <laughs> um it's probably um yeah a bit of my identity i see myself as a social worker it matters um the ethos matters, the principles matters. Been doing it for a while, I guess. It's the only thing I've ever really done. Went mm. to university at 21 to study social work because that's the normal thing to do. Um, <laughs> I was always passionate about advocating and protecting and promoting children's wellbeing because they don't have a voice. Um, so yeah, I didn't have a voice, so I wanted to give children their voice as well. So that's me. What do you mean you didn't have a voice? Uh, so I'm interested in protecting children because I wasn't necessarily protected. Mm. Um, and so I want, to, basically, I, I want someone who's going to be able to advocate. You know, I want to be the person advocating. I want to be the person protecting that child, safeguard, safeguarding that child, um, promoting their well-being because they deserve it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that wasn't done to me. And that, I guess, fueled something in me to do it for other children. Um, so yeah, that's what I mean by I didn't have a voice. Things happen that shouldn't have happened and if I can prevent that from happening to another child yeah. or at least help that child kind of recover from their life experience, their lived experience, then yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. Excellent, and you know what? I think talking to you just a, the few minutes before we, we, we came live, I, I recognize that there is a lot more passion in you than I knew that there was when I started working with you or working alongside you mm. oh I'm, I'm looking forward to it and i want to thank you in advance for being very open about yourself mm. because we're going to talk about a couple of interesting things one of them first being dyslexia oh actually no 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 this is what <laughs> i wanted to do because <laughs> before we go into it actually and it's actually about your personal challenges with dyslexia. That's what we're looking yeah. at today. Mm -hmm. Can a social worker have dyslexia and still practice? Um, there might be some stigma around that. I want you to mm -hmm. kind of let us know how it works. But before we go into that, Elizabeth, how is your day going? And what are your, what are your plans after this podcast? So my day is is happening. <laughs> like, like, um, it, it's a Monday, it's, it's, it's a social work day. Um, I think coming off the back of all those bank holidays that we really enjoyed. Yeah, that's right. Now we're just trying to catch up because mm. we enjoyed ourselves, mm -hmm. cool. Um, and then we came back and we have work to do and we've missed those days. So 
Yeah. Um, so I've been catching up with that. Uh, my day is um, definitely not over after this. I need to um, get some work done. Uh, so I'll be going back to work. Um, I remember you asked me how long it was going to take me. And my honest answer was, well, I don't know. I'm dyslexic. So it's going to take as long as it takes. Ah, uh, interesting. Uh, interesting. <laughs> so he's like, oh, look, people don't know, but it's 8 p.m. at the moment. No, actually, no. It's 10 past 8 at the moment, p.m. Yeah. And so we were debating, shall we do this? Shall we do this? And we agreed to do it. I feel guilty. <laughs> um, I honestly do. I feel so bad because no. although we debated, I'm still, I've got that kind of guilt factor on me. But you said you'd do it. And I appreciate that so much. And I've been looking forward to this one in particular because I'm really all about people just bearing, in the sense, bearing all about themselves yeah, yeah. as an encouragement for others. Mm. Um, for yourself, you mentioned to me that you are dyslexic. And I was like, mm. would you talk about it? You said yes. Um, initial thoughts, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. It's quite stereotypical. It may be stereotypical, judgmental, but I think you can take it. And that is, can I, you know, if, if we were flying a plane. Yeah, yeah. And the captain said he's dyslexic, how comfortable would I feel? Yeah. If you're a social worker and you have that, how much of a disability of that is, is it? And can I trust you? And I'm, and I'm, I'm approaching this in a, I'm actually looking at the stereotypes and I'm saying, mm -hmm. it help me undo them. Yeah, yeah. How can you be dyslexic mm -hmm. and a social worker? at yeah. the same time and, and how, what is your experience you could tell us where it began you yeah. know wherever you want to start with that yeah so I guess I guess it's to you like you've got to understand in terms of the stereotype for dyslexia mm -hmm. um is that you're thick that you're stupid that is the general like people think mm, does that mean that you can't read does that mean mm -hmm. that you can't write like does it mean that you can like and and then they and that's all they understand about dyslexia mm -hmm. so I understand that's the perception of dyslexia. Um, when I was, I wasn't diagnosed with dyslexia until I was in university. Um, my English teacher in secondary school said, I think you're dyslexic. And then he followed it up with, I kid you not, but you'll be okay because you're smart. Okay. And then that was it. No help, nothing, just carry on in my memory, right? Um, and... Mm. So, so I just carried up and I was like, okay, well, then, you know, I did, I, you know, it's kind of 16. You don't know. One, I didn't really understand what dyslexia was, dyslexia was, although I would say the word dyslexia and the spelling is a joke for people who are dyslexia, dyslexic. Like it's really hard to spell all the time. Every dyslexic I've ever met is like, why have they chosen this word to describe us and for it to spell the way it is? But basically anyway, like it just, so I didn't know anything about it and for me, I guess, because mine, in some ways it's severe, in some ways it isn't. But if by the time I was diagnosed, I was 18. So it meant that I'd already put in coping mechanisms mm -hmm. to, to kind of compensate for my, for my, um, my additional need. Mm. So it means that, like, I like to be super organized because if I can find things and I can put things together, um, then then I don't have to kind of worry about that. Um, it means that I'm incredibly detailed. Um, which you're saying means, you're saying that that's what dyslexia makes you, or that's what you how you chose to cope. To I think manage. it's a bit of both. I think dyslexia is about creative is about having a creative mind. Um, it just means that your work your brain works differently, and I think a lot of people don't understand that, so they think it's a, it, you're not neurotypical. Your brain works differently, and that's automatically a bad thing. But mm. there are many. Um, there are many people who have done many things in life who are mm. dyslexic, um, like in terms of inventions and things like that. Mm, so it just means mm. that your brain works differently mm. and that's okay. And I think for me, even though the stereotype was that, okay, it means you're thick, it means you're stupid. I think I was protected from that a little bit because the teacher who kind of recognized it then called me smart immediately and then didn't offer any help. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't offer someone help, but because I was diagnosed quite late, it meant that I had to have coping mechanisms. I had to find a way because I didn't know there was anything like it's always been my brain. My brain has always worked like this. 
So okay. So, so tell me, tell me, give me some of the more symptomatic aspects of it. Like what okay. is it so for, like for you? So for me, because yeah. it's different for everyone. So for me, my spelling isn't great. My, my spelling is poor. Mm -hmm. um, I can, so it takes me longer to read information. Right. So if you send me something, it takes, it takes me longer to read it. When I was yeah. growing up, I need a different background, so a different overlay. So I would have like a blue overlay that I'd put on top of my work to help make the words stand out. Yeah. Um, if I'm reading things or if I'm proofreading my own work, sometimes that's difficult because I will add or take out words and not realize that I'm doing it. And that's the same with reading. So when I read something, um, it's, 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 never, it's never been an issue where it means that I have missed out information, but it means that I might structure the sentence differently. Um, so well, in, in, in a in a poorly like a grammatical layout. Yeah. So it might be like, um, for an example, um, I was in the car. So it would, and then it would be like something like, I was in the car and I saw this. I saw this whilst I was in the car. So there, it, it means exactly the same thing, but it is slightly different. Right. Um, so it's just about watching those things as a social worker. So it means that I am. Um, I, I tend to reread things a couple of times. That's double work. Reread? It's, it's double the work. Oh, like, it's double you, the work. When you're, when you're writing your assessments or reading reports or whatever, yeah, you're, yeah. you're having to go over it more than once, which can be yeah. tiring. I don't know. So, yeah. Um, so, so well, I'll get on to being tired. So, so I reread things more than – so I proofread things. I reread things. Um, but so, but you can get software nowadays that – that, so as you type, it reads it out to you, and that picks oh. up any of the mistakes. So then right. that means that you're not using that much time. Um, I think it's double work, but I've never known anything differently. Right, right. Does that make right. sense? So, yeah. um, and for me, like, I want to put as much detail in as possible and I want to get it right because that child deserves to have it right. Mm. So um, I just do it. it hmm. Yeah. <laughs> But I think in terms of kind of answering your question as in like, uh, do, how can I trust you to be a social worker? <laughs> Sorry to ask you like that, but I, I thought... No, 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 I hear it. I hear it. Like, yeah. Yeah, like um, you can trust me as much as someone who is self-aware, which you need to be as a social worker. You need to understand what you bring into that situation. You need to, a social worker needs to have passion and a, a social worker needs to know the areas of development. Um, so th those are all things that I have as someone who is dyslexic personally. Some people, they don't care about this dyslexia. They go on and they say it doesn't affect them. I mm. can't say that about my dyslexia. I'm aware of how it impacts me. Mm. And so I make sure that those things are covered. Also, in terms of detail and memory, yeah. um, I don't know if it's the same for every dyslexic, mm. um, but like my memory is... It, it is just very, very good. I've almost got a photographic memory when I go in to see houses and, you know, when I'm going in to talk about the condition of the house or there was this and there was that, like I can I can put myself through that and I'll, so I'll detail all of it. So I'll write all of it. So you'll have a very detailed case note or a very detailed assessment. Yes, it might take me longer to get there and therefore it means that I might accrue more toil um, because I'm working longer, because I'm not, I'm, I'm not the kind of person that's saying, okay, well, I'm dyslexic, so I'm just going to quickly do it, and then you, you get what you get. Like it matters what I write down. That child can come and, and request their details at any time to see their files. So why wouldn't I take the time to write down what's in my mind, what I can remember, why it's yeah. concerning, why it's not concerning, right. you know, what, what's positive. Um, mm. And I think uh, some people, so my, dyslex, my, my dyslexia, I'm quite creative. I'm quite, um, I find it easy to communicate with people. And those are all different strengths in terms mm -hmm. of being dyslexic. So actually, do you need to be a communicator to be a good social worker? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so I can do that quite easily. Um, and that probably is because of my dyslexia and actually being able to understand why, like, okay, so I understand that 
someone says something, I might need to hear it twice in a sense of like numbers is probably where it trips me up the biggest, like the most. So I, if I phone you up, Curtis, and I can't get hold of you, I need to leave my number. I'll say my number twice. I say my number twice so that if you need to go back and hear in the digits, you don't have to listen to the whole voicemail again. Because when people say numbers, I can't always find it in my brain. Does that make sense? No. No, no, it is making sense. I'm just absorbing this experience. Yeah. I'm trying to uh, externalize and put myself yeah. in, in your experience. So, for instance, as a social worker, loads of people have my number and loads of people call me and they'll say, um, oh, hey, Elizabeth, I haven't got hold of you. This is my number. And they'll just roll off a number and then they'll say, bye. I can't pick up that number straight away. I can't. I, like, I, I don't know why I cannot do it. So if that's okay. it, stop. I can't either. But I sometimes so I literally cannot find the numbers like I can't. I can hear it, but I can't find the numbers in my head to write it down. Okay. And sometimes with my numbers. So, like, so hold on. If you're listening to a message that says 07852441441, did I say that too fast? You said it too fast. Um, and also sometimes the digits get, they get, um, I don't know how to explain it. So when I, when I hear a number, I see a number in my head, but sometimes I don't always see the, the, the right number. So I have to look for, I, like, I literally have to look for me. I have to look for it. And so if you say, something like uh i don't know maybe like five i might i might look like for an eight in my head because the five and the eight can be a bit similar sometimes it's kind so of like saying, so sometimes you're getting the number numbers muddled up yeah yeah or i might say five but you then you picture an eight mm. so i then if i say hey curtis i can't get hold of you um this is my number i will say my number again because i know that i have a need and therefore I make your, if you're saying you can't pick it up, now I've made your life easier because you've not got to listen to the whole voice note again, the voicemail. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or I'm like, a note of what you're saying. Um, so, so I think because I'm dyslexic, I am more able to understand that people have, or I, I am familiar with the idea that people's needs are different to mine. And therefore uh, when working with parents or working with children or working with foster carers, I use that as a strength to come alongside them mm. and get them to the point where I need them to be as a social worker, or at least <laughs> demonstrate that they can't get there and therefore <laughs> we need to do another intervention. So, so you're more ready than, hmm, I could say most, I don't know, but I'm going to say anyway, you're more ready than most because you are in that experience of mm. disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you 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 will naturally be in a position to we're, we're going to advocate from the, mm -hmm. from the get go. Yeah, yeah. That, that, so in a sense, that could be seen as a superpower, even though it would be seen as many as has been seen in the past before as a disability. Yeah, yeah. I think time telling. So as a social worker, it's, it's so easy to be late because we've always got things to do. Yeah, um, definitely. And time. Say, what's wrong with that? That's normal. What, what, what? <laughs> but so like telling the time can be quite difficult sometimes because again it's the numbers thing. So like often they'll say, Oh, when's your visit? And I'll say, um, or they'll say, When's the time or when's the visit? And I'll say, maybe four o'clock. But because because I've read it as like fourteen hundred, I've said four o'clock, but actually it's two o'clock. So it's about making sure that I'm writing things in a way that I understand. So. Oh, so, okay. Uh, personal question. Yeah. Reading an analog clock. Yeah. Can you read one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But okay. I guess it's the use of that time or the recollection of the time. It just that... takes, it just, it's just something I need to concentrate on. When I, <laughs> when I was in year six, you never needed your sacks. I just missed out all the questions to do with clocks. I can now tell the time, but like at the time, like I just couldn't do it. I struggled and I was like, okay. This is this is something I'm not good at. Well, I'm going to use most of my time on things I'm good at because it's an exam and that makes sense. But does that? So I found ways to get round things. So, so then I'm going to ask an ignorant question, and I'm asking these ignorant questions for a good reason mm -hmm. because I'm about addressing stereotypes. Mm. Um, so I appreciate your bravery again. Why don't you just? It, this is surely a case of just go and uh, go to reading classes. Yeah. A tutor. 
Um, what would you say to that to deal with it? Because maybe you could just strengthen yourself in that area. So I think part of it is strengthening. So I never used to read outside of kind of academics when I was growing up, but I now read. Mm. Um, so that's helped. Um, I now also like I will Siri types half of my assessments for me because I'll, I'll be typing and I'll say, Siri, how do you spell? Seriously, uh, I'm like, Siri, yeah, how yeah. do you spell? And I'm like, OK, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, or I Google and sometimes Microsoft is no help at all because mm. Microsoft's just like, well, you're way off. So I can't help with that. So I Google it because that helps as well. I have like software, read and write. So I am strengthening things. But mm. the fact that my brain is wired differently mm. means that that's just the way it works. So it's about finding a way to navigate through that and do my job. Which, I mean, I mean, I don't know if, if it's a... I'm very mindful about how I might come across. No, it's fine. Go for it. Because, <laughs> because I don't want to be condescending, but things that would naturally be a compliment, sometimes I think, oh, is that, how's that going to sound? But mm -hmm. it would be fair to say that your English teacher was right because I would never have guessed mm -hmm. that you were dyslexic unless you told me. Yeah. Partly because you, your conduct of language is excellent. It's better than mine by far. Um, I don't know if I'm dyslexic, but you're making me think, oh, it's like you've put some stuff on me now. Like, actually, I struggle with that as well. So, what's going on, Curtis? You know, but interesting. I, I guess some of us might well be. Yeah, yeah. Is, is this a, and I want to bring this up real quick, and maybe you know or don't, but are we using Europeanized standards to understand this, or is this, you know, like, for example, uh, IQ tests are. Mm -hmm. Europeanized standards so they're not really accurate as to someone's intelligence necessarily yeah. but how would you say that you know when you're kind of being assessed about dyslexia do you think it's so um, I I don't so I got like I said I got assessed when I was in um, university so I was about 18 um, the assessments are hours long they're really long um, and actually quite tiring because it's 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 trying to work out how you think um, dyslexia has nothing to do with intelligence mm. at all. It's got nothing to do with your IQ. Mm. Um, but there's a stereotype that it's got everything to do with your IQ. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Mm. All of my sisters, so I've got two sisters, were all dyslexic. Mm. My mum's dyslexic. My mum's also a social worker. My sister's got a master's in biomedical science. Wicked. My other sister studied law and music. Um, so dyslexia, yeah. it, 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 you know, it's just the way your brain works. Right. Like if, if I was, like if I was colorblind or, I mean, I've got a colleague also who's, who's, um, who's legally blind, but, um, it doesn't mean that you can't social work. It means that you may have, um, circumstances that you need to overcome and you need to work yeah. in a different way. Mm. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't social work. And I think actually because, because I know that I need to apply myself, I need to make sure that I'm writing, cause I'm, partly because I'm conscientious, but also because I understand that I'm dyslexic and I, and I want to put detailed in my, details in my case notes, in my assessments. Um, it means that I focus more on it, um, mm. which is hard to do in social work, even though we do so much paperwork. Do you know what? But equally, I love writing. Like, I, I love writing. I don't know why. I, I enjoyed writing my dissertation, and I'm dyslexic. Like, it was fun. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting my head around it. I, for those of you who are just going to listen to the podcast, there's a silence over here because I'm just really processing how much I didn't know mm. and processing what you're giving me. Yeah. And if anything, we have to have hope that anyone can do, almost anyone can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there shouldn't be that many. You, you exist, I've made a quick note, you have, um, and you probably wouldn't know it, but you have a higher level of resilience because you're starting at a, because we're such an academic as well as practical vocation, yeah. you're, you're, come, you're, you're having to, in a sense, redo your work when you've done your work yeah 
you're putting in more, you're extremely re resilient mm -hmm. and probably overworked. <laughs> So, okay, so you talked about being tight, like, like, it sounds like it's more work, so it's tiring. Mm. Um, so when I'm tired, my dyslexia is worse, because my brain mm. is tired. Mm. So there comes a, a, a cutoff point <laughs> that I'm learning, actually, am I too tired to do this right now? Or so sometimes like I'll write case notes, but I won't finalize them. I don't know if everyone has that on their systems, but basically, it's a, you can save a case note, and then you can finalize it, which means that you can't edit it. So sometimes I write things, I'm like, okay, my brain's just not in a place where it can go back. Mm. It can kind of re like read through that and understand it properly in the way it needs to. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, yeah. Have you had to make, this is the last question I have on this topic. Have you yeah. had to make any disclosures and has it kind of impeded you from getting employment? No. Um, I always disclosed, so I always disclose it because it's not something... So being a, so, so it's just part of my identity, isn't it? It's, it's part of who I am. So I, I'm a black woman. Um, I'm, I have dyslexia. I'm a social worker. These are all different things that are part of my identity. Um, none of which I'm ashamed of. Um, legally, they can't. Um, they can't use that against me. They're supposed to support me. Disability Act, mm -hmm. you know, um, and. Like I'm, I'm a good social worker and I have evidence to prove that I used so I used to write and I never thought that I would do it I used to write SGO assessments I did that for three and a half years so SGO assessments so special guardianship special guardianship assessments is where basically a child's been removed and you want to place them with someone who knows them like a connected person assessment so my assessments every three months were in assess of 50,000 words and I would be doing assessments and writing assessments and my manager would then we got a new service manager and um, she was feeling a bit overwhelmed so she sent some of her work she sent some of the stuff that she needed quality assure to the, to the service manager she said to me I send your stuff because I know it's good and it's not going to be an issue hmm interesting yes it takes me a little bit longer but then that might be because I'm writing more and, and, and writing more because yeah, I think I'm probably writing more because that's partly to do with the person I am, partly to do with being conscientious, partly to do with my passion for being social work, and partly because if I'm making a decision, I want to take the reader through everything as to why that's my conclusion, that's my recommendation. Mm. Um, because one, the courts need to see it. Yeah. Two, the 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 perspective special guardian is going to see it, and actually that child might see it as to why you've decided that. I can't live there or why I can live there. Mm. Um, so just in terms of like famous dyslexics, yeah. so like Albert Einstein, Jim Carrey, Walt Disney, Tom Cruise, like Alonzo Bloom, there's loads, even Richard Branson, these people are dyslexic. So it's not about intelligence. If anything, it brings something. Um, diversity has always been positive in any way or shape or form. Um, and, and dyslexia is part of that. It sounds like the world is shaped around a particular type of maybe learning style. Oh, and, yeah. and I guess we're slowly embracing difference as a strength, as, a, as opposed to a weakness. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So like, and I'm learning about um, that for me because um, I don't know, maybe I say this because I'm a social worker, but my assessment was, my assessment of dyslexia was done in university and it was about how to help and support me to achieve a degree. My argument to that is then, shouldn't there be assessments for when you're in work so it can, 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 like it can support you entirely? Because it's slightly different. Me, me studying and writing for a degree is different from social working. This, this, is, this is an interesting topic for me. So yeah, I can work it out and that's great. But there are people who maybe can't work it out completely themselves or might need a little bit some more support. And that's different to access of work, um, access of works assessment that the government do, because they're looking about kind of like what's it called? They're saying, oh, what kind of um, product or what kind of software can we put to support you? Really, what you need to be doing is empowering people to understand their disability. 
because once you do that then it's, it's that then they can take that anywhere and then they, they can know what to ask for know what to ask for mm. on a funny topic before we finish with this next year um, so I worked for an organization um, I asked for a specific um, software they kindly gave I mean kindly they gave it to me and then you had to renew it every year so then someone from the IT um, service sent me an email saying do I still need it or has anything changed oh because you've <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> we, we Cured. Yeah. You've had it for a year. You should be cured by now. That's what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's like, he was like, uh, do you still need it? Has anything changed? And I was like, <laughs> respectfully. Ah, that's isn't it? Yeah, because it's just awareness, isn't it? This is yeah, awareness, yeah. isn't it? But like, I love the way my brain works. Yeah. Um, you can. You've embraced that now. You, yeah. you just know how it works. You've seen the strengths, you've seen the weaknesses, and you just embrace them both. Yeah. Mmm. I got more from this than I planned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can slide on to the second in, uh, topic of interest for you, mm. um, which is looking at identity. Because mm. if you embrace your strengths and weaknesses, um, very briefly, how do you, and I ask you about how, how you identify. It's the broader issue, not necessarily just gender, but... If I asked you straight now, how do you identify what your answer would be? So I would say I identify as a black woman um, who, but I have Nigerian heritage, but it's heritage, not culture. So it's very different for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get into that a bit later. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm a social worker. It's part of my identity is on my Instagram. No one asks, but it's still there. So clearly it's important. Um, yeah, those are probably the three, four main things mm -hmm. um, about my identity. Can you say, can we say what you do now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you work in, as a, um, doing fostering assessments. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I've moved from that team, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm still on the fostering team, but I've stopped doing SGO assessments. And I'm now I'm just working with foster carers on a, on a long-term basis and supporting them um, with their placements uh, <laughs> and all the difficulties that that, that causes, which should be surprised. No, you can't surprise me. <laughs> I've got one for you. <laughs> okay. okay. So, okay, okay. I, th I think we're going to touch on it, I'm guessing. All right, okay, yeah. let's, go, yeah, yeah. let's go. All right, so I'm trying to read your mind now, which is one of my superpowers. Okay. Um, um, the downside is, is that I think too much. That's yeah. Cool. Them. so i'm really always reading people i never stop mm -hmm. it it can be taxing but that's another superpower we'll talk about another day and and so one of the interesting dilemmas situations that you might find mm -hmm. in supporting young supporting young people is something around transracial or transcultural placements yeah 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 go for it so I think, do you know what? I think part of it stems out of like, like I was kind of alluded to before I even get into that. Like, so I, like I said, I'm a black woman. Yeah. Um, both my parents are Nigerian. I, uh, you know, I grew up with the food, understand the language, speak the language a little bit, but it was never really part of my, something, it wasn't something I assumed as my own identity. Like I said, it was always my, it was always my heritage and my culture. So I've always found like a really, funny thing like I've just tried to understand myself a bit better and what what's important to me and what makes me who I am not just because people say that's who you are um and also I tend I live in a I grew up in a very white dominant place that's just where my parents um raised me I then moved to another place that's that is just as white British dominant that, that's just the demographics out there um uh, so yeah, so I think just in terms of identity, it's always been something that's been very interesting to me. Like even little things like, um, and I, women can wear their hair however they want to wear their hair. But when I was growing up, I was very, very young. My mum relaxed my hair. I didn't know my natural hair until I was like, until maybe two and a half years ago. That was a lot for my identity, just what? understanding my natural hair. Two and a half years ago? Yeah, yeah. So I did the big chop. I know this is a side issue, but I did the big chop. And oh, just this is part of the topic. 
This yeah, just yeah. understanding my natural hair um, helped me understand my identity in a way that I was not expecting um, at all. Very quickly, why did you chop your? Why did you make that decision? And I say, and I ask, it's a very important question. I think for the way I know it, black women. Yeah. Black is a broad term. Just always mm -hmm. want to make that clear. But um, everybody makes these. Dis a, 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 any black woman who makes that decision, it's a big decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So what informs that? So um, I like, I've always loved my hair. So I would relax my hair every six weeks. I would literally go to the hairdressers every two weeks to have it treated. So I like I spent a lot of money on my hair and I still do just in different ways. But like I was I was dedicated and diligent with my hair. Mm -hmm. And then I um, I got glandular fever. Um, okay. Have you heard of glandular fever before? I've heard of it. Yeah. So basically, it's just like a your immune system just crashes. Like you can catch it, and I, I call it from looking after my sister. Um, and it affects everyone's body differently. Mm -hmm. um, there's research that suggests <clears throat> that um, it affects your body differently, <laughs> and trauma's got to do something with that. But we won't even get into that anyway. So. Um, it basically was it it stopped me working full time i had to go back i had to go down to i was off sick for three months then i had to go part-time um and it, it nearly it nearly turned into a chronic fatigue yep it was that bad yeah so in all of that my hair just was breaking mm. like i was just sick and it was breaking and i couldn't you know we trimmed it we did all steaming, treatment, all sorts of things. Mm. Stretched out, relax, like just, we did trying everything. To trying to treat it externally. It's external yeah, treatment. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it just wasn't working. And, and just having my hair fall out every time I was brushing it or combing it, really, like, or even finger combing it, was just, I would cry. Yeah, of course. I would just, I was so distressed. Um, so I just said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. Um, and so I just just went to the hairdresser and said, like, just take it all off. Yeah. It's a big chop. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I did that. And uh, and, and like, growing up, my, my hair's quite thick. I mean, it, it doesn't look thick now because I've, I've, I've blow dried it. But generally I don't. Um, and my mum would be like, your hair's hard, your hair's thick. Like it was hard to, you know, manage. So let's just put chemical on it because that's what we do. Um <laughs> That's this is a deep did. topic for me. This is a deep topic for me. I, oh, sorry, I, I cut you. No, I, yeah, no, it's a deep no. topic because I, I think that we're 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 moving more into it now, mm. especially since Black Panther came out. But um, we're moving more into it now. But this is this is going to fit nicely into this whole identity thing. So I'm speaking yeah. for you. But it, it's a big topic for me for people to embrace who they really are. Yeah. yeah. But go ahead. This is, yeah. So yeah. you know, yeah. I learned to. Mm love my 4c hair mm. um i learned what products worked for it what products didn't had some funny things i tried to do with my hair like put banana in it because i tried to do a banana conditioner and then i yeah. spent four hours trying to get the rest of the banana out like, it was, <laughs> like you know but i was i oh, i remember yeah. being so nervous because i've always had a difficult relationship with my hair because my parents relaxed my hair so young, actually they gave me jerry curls. They gave me Michael Jackson jerry curls. Jerry curls. Yes. Man, I didn't think that still existed. Well, I mean, when I was five, I'm 31 now, so. Oh, jerry curls back then. Okay. Yeah, and then it was breaking, mm. and so they cut my hair. My parents cut it all off, and I went to a new school, and a child put their hand up and they said, "Miss, is she a boy?" And so cutting my hair was a big thing, but it meant that I learned more about my identity. That's the point. I learned more about who I am. I learned that that our hair is beautiful, even if you don't see it on TV. I mean, now you do, but it, it was different when I was growing up, you know. Um, and women can wear their hair however they want. It's absolutely their choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for me, it meant that I understood and loved myself more, and it was a journey. Mm. Um, and what was, I guess, what was even more ironic in that it was that. It was my my now husband. I mean, he's my now husband now, but at the time he was just my partner, and it was my wife um, partner who was helping me embrace my hair. Um, all of this to say, <laughs> I'm really passionate about identity and a different form. Mm. Like, I think that identity 
means different things to different people. Um, and just because, like, for instance, like I said, I see Nigerian Yoruba culture as my as my heritage, not my own personal culture. My yeah. sisters are more in touch with it and they consider it to be their culture. Yeah. And neither of that, I'm not wrong and they're not wrong. You know, that's their identity. And we ought to respect children. We ought to support children to do that. Children who are looked after, children who we have said their parents are not um, deemed fit enough to care for them and not and they can't provide them with the basic care that they need. So we have removed them. They've reached significant harm. So we've taken them out. We've hold on, hold on. You're going too fast now. Sorry, sorry. You're going too fast now. Sorry. This, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is it. Uh, uh, okay. Um, a child is, what are you saying? A child is placed in, um, or is it an assessment stage? What are you looking at now? So I'm looking at, I'm looking at when we, when we remove the child, when a child has become looked after. Right. So we as the local authority have said that parent is not meeting that child's need. That child is at risk or likely to receive significant harm. That child needs to be removed. We've gone through PLO. The courts have said it's a, you know, it's a care order. Or even actually, even if it is just an ICO, if they're in from care order, if, the, if we've removed them, that child and that child is no longer with their parents and they're now in foster care in the care system, mm. as people will say, mm. then mm, we have a duty to make sure that not only are we supporting them to repair from the trauma that they've experienced, but that we are meeting their needs holistically. And that includes their identity. And so we cannot do that if we don't educate our foster carers. But but more to the point, we don't educate ourselves as social workers. Can I, so, can I throw something in? I, yeah. I want to throw something in here. Having just... I work in a borough. Mm -hmm. I'm changing boroughs this week, but I work in a borough oh, that okay. we have a lot of I you call it minority, black children. Mm -hmm. It's a, a wide scope of black. Mm -hmm. um, because of the, the, the child's, call it record. Yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 the list of risks and safeguarding issues and the history. Foster carers are not interested. Yeah. Um, so we, we go to the placements team, say, please put out a request for a placement. I thought. Hmm? Are you looking for an IFA, like an independent independent fostering agency? Well, they yeah they put it out to yeah. uh, and then residential um, mm -hmm. um, and placements as well, and the only one that comes up is in Wales or Scotland. Mm -hmm. The ones that always come up first are Wales and Scotland. This is these are London kids. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the time they're going to be of of uh, eth of um, minority ethnicity so mm -hmm. to speak, if I can say that term. So I, I recently just put a, ch a child somewhere quite far and I haven't appropriated their culture or their cultural needs, okay. which is something that you're talking about now Yeah, that can be easily missed. So when they go to that place, if they have something that they can hold on to, which is a part of their identity, yeah. They probably don't even recognise as a part of their identity until it's lost. Yeah. Um, then they are then further, much more so, in a new world. Mm -hmm. Even if it was a hundred miles away, it's still a new world. Whereas we've had black girls saying, "Where I need hair products." Yeah. And I've heard of over the years disputes in the homes where they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. Where can yep. we find this stuff? Sorry, I'm going to let you take it from here, but this is something that you're waking up inside me yeah. to reinforce my practice. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, so I, so my thing is that like, I just feel that, do you know, I'm going to say it with my chest because I fully believe it. Come on. If we don't do it, it's a disservice to those children. Mm, you say it, yeah. That's the reality. And whilst I'm not suggesting that it means a placement breakdown, I don't see how we're holistically meeting that child's needs. Mm. So it's, it is, yes, okay, fair enough. You know, it is, sometimes it is about hair products. It's about skin um, and the products they need for their skin. Yep. But it's also about literature. It's also about representation. It's also about music. 
It's also about finding ways to link them into their community. Um, and it's important. And if we don't support them to do that, then we're, then we're not supporting them to become adults and we're not doing the whole five, you know, every child matters, five outcomes. We're not doing that. Yeah. But I also want to say that I want to say that, you know, in terms of inclusivity, like it's it's just as important for any foster carer, even if they're matched with a child who um, is the same ethnicity as them, to understand the importance of diversity and to teach the children in their care that as well. So I'm not just advocating for little black girls to have black dolls that look like them. No, every child should have a black doll that look that, that you know. Every child should have a doll that, that has a disability, a hidden one or, you know, like we need to be looking at difference and diversity and, and we need to be taking proper acknowledgement of it. Because yeah. for far too long, it's not really been what we've been doing. And so we've been failing children. Like an yeah. example of this is I came back to the borough that I now work for, who I used to work for before, mm. um, met some foster carers, There's, um, they're white. And the child that they've been caring for is a mixed race. Mm. And um, they've been caring for that child for six years. Um, that child, basically that child then came to school a couple of days later, well, a couple of, maybe a month later, made an allegation that um, they were using the, and this is extreme, but this is not, they were using the N-word. Who was using it? The, the carers? Yeah. But the foster carers weren't, they had another child who was using it and they, so they were repeating the word. Right. And so the mixed race child, let's call him Jack, Jack was saying, you can't use that word. Like, and they were like, no, 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 no. As long as we're not saying it to a black person, then it's not, um, then, 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 it, then it's not an issue. The listeners cannot see my face right now, but <laughs> no, no. Did I hear you right? You had me right. And you said, I couldn't surprise you. <laughs> it's 2022 what are you talking about right um and anyway so this it gets worse so then this child comes you know and then so this child is standing up for himself as he should and he's saying you can't use that word it doesn't matter if you're using it in um in, in you're just you're telling another child they shouldn't use it you cannot use that word it's offensive um and so the female Kara felt that she was in the right, and therefore um, the child alleges that he um, that she continued to say the word over and over again. So I hear about this. <laughs> it's my job to go and explore it. It's my job to go sort it out. Okay, cool. So I'm happy to do that. My manager checks in on me. Is like, are you sure you want to do this? Mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> my manager's white just for the listeners who don't know well I actually I've said I'm black so everyone knows now um mm. so and I'm like yeah I, I like I not only am I passionate about it I don't want to be the only other black person in that child's life and then just leave because I can when he's had to be subjected to it what does that tell that child yeah so anyway, I go and discuss it Curtis it does not go well Okay. She says, base, she, <laughs> uh, bless her, her white fragility comes out in all its glory. Tears? Uh, no, she got angry. She said, I need to be careful. She slammed her hand on a table. She walked away, told me I need to go find a different placement for all these children, but she's not doing it anymore. Okay. Um, and all that time, I'm just, and you know, and she's, and I just said, look, because, so, 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 The elephant in the room is that I'm black, right? So I don't start there. and I don't want them to think I'm taking it personally because I'm really not, um, at least not at that time. Um, so I say, <laughs> right? So I said, society as a whole has decided yeah. that word's offensive. Like this isn't something that I decided. Society as a whole has decided that that word's offensive. Oh, but Elizabeth this, oh, but Elizabeth that. Society as a whole has decided that this word is offensive. And I have to say that a couple of times, still not getting it. 
then they're, they're then saying that I need to have made sure that foster carers have this training because they've never been aware of that. Yeah, there are some, obviously, there are some greater issues there, I understand. The male carer is just like, well, if this is an envelope, why can't I call it an envelope? Yeah, okay. And I'm just like, um... <laughs> so anyway, we, we unpack it, we explore yeah. it. They're angry, they're shouting. And I say, well, I'm going to leave. I've, I've told you what this child's alleged. I've raised the concern. I've tried to discuss it with you. Obviously, you're a bit frustrated. It can tell we're all feeling a bit heated at the moment. So we're just having circular conversations. I'm going to go. I'm going to call you tomorrow and we can address it. Um, needless to say, it doesn't go very well. Um, they're still of the opinion that um, they that I think they were very heated when they said it. So they were talking about wanting to basically have the children taken out of their care. And, that, you know, that that's how and, and ah. I, I had accused them of being racist. Ah. And I said, I said, it's a racial slur. I didn't call you racist because, frankly, if I'm trying to talk to white people about racism, I don't call them racist because that gets their back up. And I'm generally trying to have a conversation. And then I phoned the social worker the children's social worker, and I'm just like, look, this, this, these are the issues, these are the concerns. I said, now I'm concerned because of their, because of their response. I'm concerned because George Floyd is murdered and that boy was in that house. How did they support him? Simple. Also, the Globe decided to have a racial awakening. Where were they when that took place? Mm. That I've only seen that child on one of, it was a new case, I've only ever seen that child on one other occasion. That child didn't go to school that day. So I couldn't tell the condition of his hair. Because obviously if you're, if you're not at home, if you're at home, sometimes kids don't do their hair. I might just leave my hair in plaits or wear my bonnet. So I'm expecting that. But his, your, his hair's never been kept as far as I'm concerned. Is, is what, that's what everyone's telling me. You're telling me, I don't know. I said to the children's social worker, well, what do they do? How do they meet his needs? Do they, does he cream his skin? Like, how does he brush his hair? Oh, and then the social worker said, oh, I don't know. I just know that Afro hair is difficult to manage. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about we're doing a disservice to our children. And so I talk about it. I uh, thankfully um, service oh, manager. Man. Service, it's it's you're right. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> you're right. But I came home. Honestly, I talk about it now, and I'm. But I came home. And, like, do you know? I'm not even going to lie. I didn't even get home. I got in my car and I cried. I cried for that little boy. Actually, he's not, he's, he's 14, but he's been there for six and a half years. So he must have gone through a lot of hell, right? That so, he doesn't even realize he went through. But so we've suggested we've suggested him to that. Mm. We've done that. Mm. So, um, like the, the council that I work with, they've asked me. Um, they had asked me anyway, but I'm doing like an EDI equality, diversity, inclusion project. That I am basically writing a document that looks at these things and and basically almost like a crib sheet of how to to support children who if you're in a cult, right. transcultural placement we need this. We need um, this. but it's not just about ethnicity it's also about disability which we did touch on gender like and um for instance most of the most of our understanding about um about autism is, a, is, is based on males and so you will find that most women who are on who are on the on autistic autistic spectrum. spectrum are diagnosed mm. as adults because we don't understand it when they're girls mm. and they're younger. Mm. It's, we're also talking about sexuality. So I'm, you know, working with people and doing a lot of the, the research myself to basically put this document together so that we can start treating these children with respect so that we can support them to grow, um, you know, because... Okay, yeah, we're going to heal from trauma and repair all the relationships, but I don't know who I am. And every child has the right to be so frustrated when they realise, because they will realise, the same way I realised that my mum shouldn't have relaxed my hair at five. <coughs> it's the same way that child's going to be like, oh, okay, so I had social workers, I had an IRO, had a foster carer, and, you know, my skin's ashy, and I don't know what hyperpigmentation is, and I don't understand that my hair might mean that I have you know more likely of keloids or in, like like there's so many things or 
you know, I don't understand what this religion means and, and I wanted to explore it a bit more and that's the religion my parents had, but then I was removed and so no one really thought about it because I was five at the time. Like, we've, we've got to do better. What, so, what, that's my passion. Th this sounds like an obvious question. I, and mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't like to answer it in an obvious way. Mm-hmm. I'd rather ask you to kind of reflect on it before you answer it. Like what happens when we don't recognize heritage enough, culture enough when supporting our children? What, what might be the default? What happens when we don't? Do you know, um, there's so many ways you could answer that. And there's so many ways that are quite obvious. But the best thing that comes to mind is like, if you, it's kind of like an analogy, if like everyone knows Lego, if most children play with Lego. If you built a block wall, a brick wall, but you left out some of the blocks, that's what we're doing to our kids. We're missing bits out that are important to them, that, that should be there. Right. Um, and we're just telling them to go on so they don't understand who they are know who they are and then they will eventually need to go on that journey so that means that we're delaying them for all the things that they should have yeah but yeah. their parents aren't fit don't get me mm. wrong children need to be removed that's just the, the world we live in as social mm. workers I'm not mm. saying that we should keep children um in the care of their parents and i'm not even saying that we should only place children in culturally matched placements because we don't like the, the, the council I work with, we don't have that option. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying is that we need to support them. So we need to support our workers, our social workers, our foster carers. We need to support everyone to help that child navigate yeah. through identity. And there's mm. no right or wrong way to do it. And that's why I'm talking about like my sisters and I both see our heritage and the Yoruba culture, Nigerian culture differently in our lives. But yeah. we've all been able to explore that. Mm. And that child will then make a decision as to what's important to them. But to deny them, we're just taking bricks from their wall. You answered that in a way I didn't expect. I needed to hear it like that. It's very easy to take that box in an assessment. Mm. I've looked at the family, I've looked at the child, but to not only mention as we often do, this child is of a, I don't know, Ghanaian heritage, uh, Roman Gypsy heritage. But what does that mean? Yeah. And that's where it matters. And also, not, not only what does that mean, but what does that mean mm. to that child specifically? Uh, and, and what definitely. may it mean to that child in the future? Mm. Mm. So I've got, I've got a child who is mixed heritage. She is um Thai and white British heritage you know I was with her today and we were talking about that and what that looks like for her and I'm always having conversations about like it's not a like as social workers we write assessments but we're also always assessing mm -hmm. that shouldn't be any different for a child's cultural needs that's an interesting mix in that at sight they may appear to be mostly white, which means that it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Well, I mean, interesting you said that. She looks more Thai than white British. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you made that assumption. So, But equally, um, how I identify is how I identify. So I might look mostly white. That doesn't mean that I don't have a different heritage. That's I've right. got another child in my caseload who is, she is white British, um, black, we, and I say black because we don't know where dad's from. Mum didn't want to disclose <laughs> who the dad was. And Italian. And it's about what, you know, it's, a, it's about letting her have exposure to all of the different cultures and letting her choose what bit matters to her and when, and it might matter more when she's younger or a certain age and, you know, her hair's always telling because her hair has got, um, it, there's, there's evidence that she um, has black heritage. Mm. So, she, so it's not kind of your straight kind of European hair. So she may identify as black in respect to that. Um, 
and but you know, need certain hair products. But equally, her mum was white. So when one of the social workers asked her, well, how do you feel like living with a white family? That That's just, just as off as well, because her mum was white. She lived with her mum. It's her mum's, you know, it's her mum's sister who's caring for her because it's connected persons. So they're white. Mm. So it's about it's about it's about not just ticking the boxes or just saying, okay, yeah, they're they're mixed heritage or this. It's about what does that mean for that child? And mm. how can I make sure that those needs are being met or you know, when necessary, where can I challenge that? I, you know what you sound like? You sound like you've got part two in you. Oh really? <laughs> Not tonight. I need to go and do my work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, another day, of course. But you sound like you have part two, and you're like, "This is um, diversity is is one of the topics of the hour, I guess, in mm -hmm. in, in in today's society." And I think that your take on it is is needed mm -hmm. because a lot of time, I guess, social workers, we as you know, in our early stages, because this this channel was already set up for originally set up for students. Oh, okay. Um, and then it's kind of grown into something more. And we learn to accrue information because it's easy to go to a family and ask them lots of questions. But what do you do with that information? Mm. Um, and so when we're looking at identity, transracial stroke, transculturalism, um, what do we do with the knowledge that someone is who they are? Mm -hmm. How can we explore that and contextualize it and meet needs through it? and yeah. help them to solidify and build their identity through it is, is really where the skills and experience are. That's where the money is. Um, I just want to say one more thing, actually. Um, you've got a great smile. Ah. It, it, you know, it, it, it was the first thing, <laughs> you know, when we clicked live, you were there with the smile and it's, um, it's radiant. So I appreciate your time and, and your your expertise tonight and I know you're off to work now <laughs> yeah but on the sofa so it's fine <laughs> oh, working from home is so hard isn't it I love um, it you like it yeah 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 in fact I'm actually I actually don't generally I like the flexibility but um, boundaries the kitchen table I've got a nice kitchen table and it became like I said no no I'm going to work I, I don't want it to be a place I hate you know yeah. dinner and laptop, no. Um, it is, it's like, all right, listen, it's like, after doing it for two years, it's like, no. Over the mm. last um, two months, I've been like, no, I'm going to the office uh, two, three days a week. Really? Because it, it, it's taking its toll now, and, you know, mm. sitting on the chair, you know, it's it's not easy. But yeah, um, working on the couch is a little bit different. I don't often do that. Mm. You know? um, my arm is a bit high. Hmm? I've got mixed up, so I sit, I sit on the sofa with my lap tray, put my laptop on top, and then just type. Whilst you're watching Netflix? Whilst I'm having something in the background. <laughs> I mean, I'm working at nine o'clock, so <laughs> I'm going to work like that. <laughs> yeah. Gets yeah. the job done, but I, yeah. Lovely. Thanks for your time. Um, mm -hmm. Guys, this was Elizabeth. Um, she's given us a lot of insight. Again, please subscribe to the channel. Please share this. This was a really powerful session on understanding. And I think we're just beginning to understand what diversity is. And I guess when we spoke about dyslexia, that's a part of the issue of diversity mm. and identity, what it means. Um, please share this and I'm going to send some clips out. Guys, thank you for your time. Elizabeth, I want to thank you again. No and we're going to end this show right here. Take care, guys. <laughs>